Uh, good morning to all. So I am welcoming all the speakers and the conveners and the uh, keynote speaker to this uh, session, AC interaction and its linkage with ecosystem response solution. So some of the key points I am telling here. So we are uh, having uh, a question and answer session after each uh, presentation, one or two questions can, will be asked during that time. And the uh, entire questions, anything is there, in the end of the session, we will take it. And uh, one more thing that uh, all these presentations will be recorded and it will be uploaded in the YouTube. So if anybody doesn't want to do that, then you may please send a mail to us, scar2022 at Elborn meetings.com before 12th of August, then we will consider it. Then we have uh, one uh, e-poster also that is already uh, placed in the exhibition space. So anybody want to go to that? You can see that and make your comments there. So these are all the main headlines uh, or guidelines for the speakers and the uh, convenors. So myself, I'm Anil Kumar, working at National Center for Polar and Ocean Research, Goa, India. And the other conveners, Dr. Anup Mahajan, working at uh, IATM, Pune. Dr. Rahul Mohan, working at National Center for Polar and Ocean Research, Goa, India. And Swanya Halfta, working at uh, NIWA, Australia. So I, I'm welcoming all of you for this session. Let us make this session a very great successful session. So may I invite the first speaker, Mr. Ramesh Kumar Yadav. So you have 12 minutes. After that, three minutes for uh, question answers. Sorry, Dr. Anil Kumar, maybe we can do the keynotes uh, no, 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 uh, yes. first Sorry. and then we can do yeah, the yeah, other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. First, the keynote speaker. Yeah. The keynote speaker is uh, Dr. Keite Ratiri. And I am requesting uh, Dr. Anu Mahajan to give an introduction about the keynote speaker. Please. Thank you, sir. Uh... Yeah, so it's a, it's a pleasure to introduce Katie. Katie Altari, uh, well, I've met her a few times as a part of the SOLAS uh, network, and uh, I know she's doing some incredible work. Uh, today, she is going to be talking about stable isotopes as a tracer for reactive nitrogen emissions and aerosol formation in the uh, ocean. Uh, Katie is a senior lecturer in the oceanographic department at the University of Cape Town. She has uh, basically been educated as a chemist, but holds a PhD in oceanography. She was a NOAA Climate and Global Change Postdoctoral Fellow for two years and then spent another two years as a postdoctoral fellow, uh, jointly appointed by Princeton and Brown Universities. After her postdoctoral time, she pursued a master's, oh, sorry, not, yes, after her postdoctoral time, she pursued another master's in public policy at the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton University. Katie has uh, received several awards, uh, some of which are uh, worthy of, uh, of mention over here also. Uh, one of which is the University of Cape Town Merit Award in 2019, then the Vice Chancellor's uh, 2030 Future Leaders Award in 2018, the Claude Leon Merit Award for Early Career Researchers in 2017, and the Presidential Rating uh, from the South African National Research Foundation in 2015, along with the Peter Wagner Award for Women in Atmospheric Sciences in 2008. So as you can see that she's extremely well decorated, but uh, more than these awards, her science speaks for itself and i'm very excited to to listen to this talk uh, and i'm i'm sure the rest of you will also learn quite a few things uh, about about southern ocean science from this talk so katie the floor is yours thank you so much Anup. what a lovely introduction i'm going to share my screen i'm going to full screen mode i trust everyone can see my full screen now yes it's all good you can go ahead Excellent. Good morning. Thank you so much, everyone, for this opportunity. I'm really looking forward to sharing some of our research with you. 
As Anoop said, I'm going to talk particularly today about the application of stable isotopes as a tracer of reactive nitrogen emissions in the Southern Ocean. So I wanted to start with a sort of big picture step back of, of what we're all interested in. So the biogeochemistry in the Southern Ocean is a really strong control on atmospheric chemistry in the marine boundary layer. Now, you can see on the solar schematic I put on the right here, it doesn't really emphasize much on what habit is happening in the surface ocean, but we know that we have biogeochemistry in terms of community composition, the rates of primary productivity, different species existing at different times under different levels of stress. All of that influences what comes out of the ocean into the atmosphere. And the remote marine atmosphere away from human emissions has quite a complex chemistry of its own. And in particular in the Southern Ocean, this complexity of what's happening in the surface ocean, the presence of ice, sea ice, as well as continental Antarctic ice, and the complexity in the atmosphere is such that climate models really struggle to simulate the complexity of the system. And a big part of that has to do with ocean and ice emissions into the atmosphere and then what actually happens in the atmosphere. Another aspect of this uncertainty comes in because of the strong presence of cloud cover in the Southern Ocean. And satellite observations, which we rely on heavily in many parts of the globe, are highly restricted by the fact that there's this um, heavy cloud cover. But of course, it's the clouds um, from a climate perspective that in some ways that are the most interesting. The other aspect of working in the Southern Ocean and trying to understand this is that there's quite hostile conditions. Any of you that have been on cruises know that it's not necessarily always pleasant. And things such as deep winter cruises um, can be especially unpleasant. And these hostile conditions can also limit long-term observations. So the essential question of my research as it relates to um, the session today is how do we identify and trace oceanic sources of reactive nitrogen gases to the atmosphere? So now that's this N-containing gases um, section here in the bottom that are coming out of the ocean. They're leading to aerosol formation it also has to do with organic gases coming out of the ocean and leading to aerosol formation. So there's nitrogen containing organic gases and it all connects back with the oxidation capacity of the atmosphere. Oops. Here we go. In particular today, I'm gonna to focus on atmospheric nitrates as it's the ultimate sink for NOx, which is a combination of NO and NO2. We refer to it as a chemical family. On the left, you can see a schematic here that shows NO and NO2 oxidation. This chemical family cycles so rapidly that we just refer to it as one species, NOx. Um, NO and NO2, once oxidized, go on to form nitrates radical at night and then N2O5. During the daytime, NO2 is oxidized to nitric acid, but ultimately the pathway for NO and NO2 is that they end up oxidized as nitric acid and atmospheric nitrate. Aerosol nitrate is a critical species. It acts as a cloud condensation nuclei and has a strong influence on radiative forcing. It also, from the pers perspective of ocean-atmosphere interactions, it contributes to reactive nitrogen deposition. What I mean by reactive is that this is a nitrogen species that is biogeochemically active, bioavailable for um, the receiving communities. As nitric acid, it's also a contributor to acidification, not a process we worry about much in the Southern Ocean, but more broadly, um, nitrate and NOx contribute. NOx itself is a really interesting species. Its cycling results in the chemical production of ozone. This is a big issue in more anthropogenically impacted areas, but there's also a natural component. Because of NOx's strong interaction with oxidants, such as ozone, OH, RO2, hydroxy, yeah, peroxy radicals, et cetera, um, it has a really strong control on the oxidizing capacity of the troposphere. And that's something we don't understand very well in more remote parts of the atmosphere. NOx primarily has anthropogenic sources, but there's also a variety um, of natural sources. And as we're talking about the Southern Ocean, of course, it's the natural sources that are more important in this context. There's a useful feature that we exploit in our research, which is that different NOx sources have different isotopic signatures. And these isotopic signatures I've denoted here by using delta N15. This is the ratio of the heavy to light isotope. We measure the isotopic signatures in a per mil scale. And so what you're seeing on the right is a schematic taken from a variety of studies that highlight the isotopic variability in NOx emissions. 
So you can see that there is on the top, starting with um, essentially coal combustion, fossil fuel plants, gasoline emissions, vehicles. These are all your anthropogenic sources. They have distinct isotopic signatures. But what's more interesting for us is moving down the line. Um, lightning has a delta N15 of zero per mil. Stratospheric NOx source has a very high delta N15. And snowpack photolysis has a very low delta N15. So it's this differentiation in the isotopic signature of NOx sources that we exploit as a way to track where different NOx sources are coming from. And what's useful about this is that when NOx is converted to nitrate, which is its ultimate endpoint always, the nitrogen atom is conserved. And so when we measure the delta N15 of nitrate in atmospheric aerosols, we can infer something about the NOx source that led to that nitrate as that nitrogen is conserved through this process. So we use the stabilized steps as a really strong tracer in this context. In this study that I'm gonna share some details with you about today, we have a set of seasonally resolved shipboard observations from Cape Town. You can see in the top picture, uh, the SA Gullis II in the Cape Town Harbor, down to the ice, wherever the ice edge was. And then the bottom right, you can see a nice photo um, of the Agullis set into some winter ice. We've gone along what we call the Good Hope transect. You can see in the image on the left here, um, in early summer, the Good Hope transect in 2018 was extended into the Riddell Sea. You can see in red that return leg in late summer in orange. We also have um, a lovely set of observations from a winter cruise in July, August 2019, and then a spring cruise. And you can see the spring and winter cruises and um, much earlier, obviously, the ice extent was much farther north, which I'll show later. The data I'm going to share with you today come from a set of filter-based size segregated aerosol collections that we did on ship um, every 24 hours. You can see in the top right um, is Jessica Berger. This is a PhD student whose work I'll primarily be talking about today. We use a high volume air sampler fitted with a um, five stage cascade impactor. We sector control to ensure that we're not just collecting ship emissions. And we put the filters through a variety of analytical and chemical procedures, ultimately resulting in the isotope measurements that I'm sharing here. And I'm happy to go into more detail on any of the methodological aspects if you're interested. We also utilize air mass back trajectories. Um, we use high split for this, the air mass modeling. And this gives us an idea of how much of an influence the sea ice, the surface ocean, and the continent, whether it's the southern African continent or the Antarctic continent, has on each sample. On the right, you can see in late summer, there was virtually no influence from sea ice or continental ice on any of the aerosol samples. Um, nor from the African continent. So in this case, in late summer, we have a very um, a set of clean oceanic Southern Ocean samples. We also rely on satellite derived sea ice as well as satellite derived chlorophyll. We we're very fortunate throughout this seasonal cruises that we had samples with a large variety of influence in terms of ice influence, ocean influence, and then samples with ice and ocean influence. And I think the spring cruise highlights this really nicely. On the left, you can see the southbound leg. In the beginning, we had samples influenced by the open ocean. And then as we moved further south, we got a lovely um, influence from the sea ice. The ship did a transect along the sea ice where we picked up again a nice mixture of ice and ocean samples. And then as the ship turned around to head back to Cape Town, the winds shifted and we ended up with, um, for the same season, samples with almost no sea ice influence where the air masses had been cruising along over the ocean for quite a while. Okay, so to get into the meat of the matter, here I'm sharing some of our isotope data. In this plot, um, I'm gonna bring in the various seasons over time. So on the y-axis, we're looking at the delta N15 of nitrate in per mil. So this is the isotopic composition of the aerosol nitrate that we collected. On the x-axis, we have latitude, starting with Cape Town on the left, and the deep south in the Antarctic on the right. I've highlighted in orange the first interaction um, where the ice edge was based on the satellite observations. We also have open symbols to denote the summer um, transects and then the closed symbols to denote the Woodell Sea. So those have different longitude. I'm applying them here along the same latitudinal line. What you can see is that although the concentrations don't vary much, I'm not sharing the concentration data, but the isotopic compositions vary significantly. So they go from being very low um, just under zero per mil in the low latitudes to slightly higher values in the mid latitudes and then very negative isotopic excursions in the deep south as we head towards the ice. 
And what this is telling us is that different NOx sources are contributing to aerosol nitrates in the low to mid to high latitudes. In the low latitudes, you can see evidence of lightning NOx. None of these air masses had influence from the South African continent. If they had, we would have expected to see much higher delta and 15 values. And so we know that we've got nice, clean background Southern Ocean sources. Lightning NOx has a signature of about zero per mil. And then as you go towards the ice in the deep south in the Weddell Sea, we see this strong negative influence from snow photolysis. So as the sunlight hits the surface of snow-covered um, Antarctic ice, you have a photo photolysis procedure which leads to the re-release of NOx from nitrate that's on the surface snow. And we're seeing that signature very nicely here. Now in green, I've layered in our spring data. The open symbols are the north-south transect, and the closed symbols are from that ice edge transect. And again, I've layered in the green line, the um, ice extent. So you can see something very similar in spring as to what we saw in summer, which is that you have this low delta N15 in the low latitudes, where you have your strong lightning knock symbol signal. As you move south and you get towards the ice, you get this very, again, very negative excursion, which is due to snow photolysis knocks. So one of the most interesting things about this transect might not be obvious if you're not an isotope person, but it's that this mid-latitude, it doesn't actually make sense. You might say, oh, you just have a mixture of your low delta N15 um, snow photolysis and your higher delta N15 lightning, but it actually doesn't work out. In the mid-latitudes, it's not a mixture. So we spent quite a bit of time trying to unravel what was this mid-latitude signal. And what we're proposing is that in the mid-latitudes, the NOx source is actually from the surface ocean. And I want to spend a few minutes taking you through how we came to this conclusion. So what you're seeing here is um, in the circles, our transect from Cape Town down to the ice. And the circles are now colored by surface ocean measurements of nitrite concentrations. And you can see here, uh, they're very low in the subtropical um, section of the Southern Ocean. But in, once we hit the um, south of the Southern Antarctic, we end up with these green colors, and that's showing you that there's a presence of surface ocean nitrite. Also, the air mass back trajectories here are colored by delta N15 of nitrate. So you can see these very low values when you have ice influence from the continent, and then your much higher values from lightning. But everywhere that we have these detectable nitrite concentrations, we have the presence of these um, mid-level delta N15 values. And what we're actually proposing is that this is from ocean alkyl nitrate production. So what happens is when you have nitrite present, the photolysis of nitrite leads to the presence of NO in the surface ocean. And the photolysis of organic matter leads to RO2 in the surface ocean. And that forms these alkyl nitrates. Now, you end up with a supersaturation. Um, and this drives a net flux of alkyl nitrates out into the atmosphere. The alkyl nitrates can then photolyze, reforming NOx as NO2, and then go on to form nitrate. They also can be directly absorbed into um, aerosol from hydrolysis. We were able to derive a delta N15 associated with NOx signature from alkyl nitrates, and it has a, using our data set, we've derived our value of around minus 22 per mil, plus or minus 7. And interestingly, a uh, study currently in review based on the Equatorial Pacific, which is another region where nitrite accumulates in the surface ocean, they used a slightly different approach and they determined that the alkyl nitrate isotopic signature has a delta N15 of about minus 23 per mil. So this is one of these situations where you could make it up. Two distinct studies, two distinct regions of the ocean, both invoking this alkyl nitrate mechanism, come up with a remarkably similar, similar isotopic signature of um, around minus 22 to minus 23 per mil. Another interesting feature in the data set that I wanted to highlight is that in the springtime, um, on the left, you can see the southbound transect and the ice edge transect. Our air mass histories aren't stretching back into the continent the way they were in the summer, which suggests that this low delta N15 excursion must actually be coming from snow photolysis on sea ice and not snow photolysis on the continental Antarctic snow. And I think this is something that's kind of novel, and not a lot of people have shown the influence of snow photolysis on, on sea ice when it comes to NOx cycling. Um, this is very common in the Antarctic continent and a well-known phenomenon. Um, but we have a nice, um, some nice evidence that the sea ice actually gives the same process. Here I'm coming back to the same figure, and now in blue I'm layering in the winter data. 
there's um, the winter data excluding the first data point, which I'll get to just now, um, is fairly invariant with latitude. There's no evidence of snow photolysis. So in blue, you can see the line where we hit the ice edge. We don't have this negative excursion. We also don't have this mid-latitude um, signal of alkyl nitrate emissions. And I want to highlight that the winter concentrations were very low. This is very much a background signal um, in terms of what we're seeing in the atmospheric nitrate in this instance. This one data point, fascinatingly, is consistent with the stratospheric NOx source. Um, in the winter, you can have the stratospheric incursions from um, denitrification of the stratosphere, and they can actually come down and mix into the troposphere. And this sample has a delta N15 signature consistent with the stratosphere, but its oxygen isotopes, which I'm not presenting today, are also very consistent with this. So this is evidence that this um, polar stratospheric clouds are influencing NOx um, even quite high um, in the Southern Antarctic, Southern Ocean. You can see here the latitude. So just to summarize a little schematic that Jess has put together of the seasonality and NOx sources and drivers in this region, you know, typically our observations are limited to the summertime. And so understanding what's happening in these other seasons is really novel and gives us an uh, opportunity to understand what's happening with things like cloud cover in other seasons. So you can see what she's put here is that you have a seasonality in the sea ice cover as well as light availability. availability. And so this really influences when you can have snowpack NOx emissions, when you can have alk alkyl nitrate emissions. And of course, the winter is the only time you have the potential for this stratospheric input to play a role. So to summarize briefly, I um, wanted to share how we can use aerosol isotope observations to quantify NOx sources. Um, in this Atlantic sector, Southern Ocean transect, NOx sources are quite similar in spring and summer. And the big NOx sources are the surface ocean, snow on Antarctica, and snow on sea ice. The winter background is characterized by very low concentrations and no NOx sources that require light because, of course, we're in an all dark environment. To bring it back to the big picture where I started with, what we're finding is that the seasonality and photolysis is a critical control on the reactive nitrogen emissions in the Southern Ocean. Typically, we think of the ocean as a recipient of nitrogen deposition. We don't think of the ocean um, as being a source of nitrogen emissions outside of maybe some ammonia emissions. And in this case, we're talking about an oxi oxidized nitrogen component. The surface ocean nitrites and dissolved organic matter concentrations are really important for air sea fluxes of nitrogen. And this is something that will be unique to the biogeochemistry of the Southern Ocean or a region like the Equatorial Pacific where nitrite actually accumulates. And we've highlighted how the photochemistry of snow on sea ice is an emitter of reactive nitrogen gases that lead to aerosol formation and clouds. So the presence, absence of sea ice, the, the waxing and waning of the sea ice in the Southern Ocean is also um, a really important control on what's happening in the atmosphere. With that, I want to thank um, everyone for their research support, and I'm happy to take questions now, later, or via email. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Katie Thierry. Uh, it is a very nice uh, presentation about the studies that you have carried out in the Southern Ocean session. I think one of the questions, uh, I request uh, Anup, if anybody has any question, uh, they can go ahead. Uh, sure. Uh, so basically, all the attendees can ask questions in the Q and A box. So if you have any, just type them out, and we'll announce them. And uh, and uh, I'm sure Katie will be able to answer them. Uh, before there are any other questions, uh, Katie, I have a question about the mid latitudinal uh, peak that you see in the in the nitrate accumulation. Right, uh, that tends to happen in the mid latitudes in 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 the South African sector, uh, but in the Pacific, you're seeing it in the tropics. Why is that? Uh, is there is that because of biogeochemistry or what is driving it? Yeah, it's an excellent question, Anoop. So it's alkyl nitrate emissions are driven by the biogeochemistry of the surface ocean because there isn't a atmospheric formation pathway. So the surface ocean is really your only source. So you have this net flux out. In order to get a net flux of alkyl nitrates, you need nitrite to accumulate in the surface ocean. From a biogeochemical perspective, my oceanographic colleagues have explained to me that this isn't really a species that accumulates a lot in the surface ocean. 
Um, the Southern Ocean is unique in that nitride um, accumulates. And the other places where you have oxygen minimum zones. And so oxygen minimum zones allow nitride to accumulate. And so that's what's leading to the signal being seen also in the equatorial Pacific. Because you're right, you wouldn't think of the Southern Ocean and something like the Equatorial Pacific as being, um, you know, sort of having related signatures. But in this way, that is something. So you have to have this unique biogeochemical um, situation where nitrite can accumulate in order to get alkyl nitrate emissions. So what you're saying is this would happen in pretty much all OMZs? Uh... All OMZs and throughout the Southern Ocean. And there's some um, evidence from other ISOTOP studies um, along the Pacific transect, where they also see this isotope excursion. They weren't quite sure what to attribute it to, but it's it, it would be the same alkyl nitrate emissions that you're seeing. Right. There is a question on the Q&A section uh, from Bhaskar, uh, who is also part of the Indian Southern Ocean expeditions. Uh, and he's asking, what is the impact of extended sunlight period air temperature on NOx measurements in your study? Does the intensity of wavelength affect photolysis, especially in a warming world? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. So what we're finding is that we need to investigate a lot more about the influence of temperature um, and wavelength on this. So we don't unfortunately have any measurements um, directly on that. Obviously, we have temperature measurements. They don't seem to be a big driver. But yes, I would expect sunlight intensity, um, as well as the uh, variations in daylight durations, have a big influence on NOx emissions, because a lot of these processes are photochemically driven. And so one of the things we'd like to do in future is um, do some more in-depth studies of things like the um, you know, J values and photolysis, and also how loss processes um, which are photolytically driven are, are um, influencing this. So yes, I expect that to be a very strong control um, on NOx in more remote regions, which is of course very distinct to our more anthropogenic regions where you have actual activity-based NOx emissions. Fair enough, thank you. Katie, I'm, uh, I uh, myself have a couple more questions, but uh, we'll try and do like a discussion towards the end. We'll go through the talks. Uh, so with that, uh, maybe uh, Dr. Anand Kumar, do you want to take control and, uh, and move on to yeah, the next speakers for now? Thank you, I think Katie. Now we can start the session with the speakers. So may I request uh, Dr. Ramesh Kumar Yadav to make his presentation. The slightly uh, swapping of Pacific and Atlantic uh, you know, influences on North Central Indian summer monsoon. So uh, uh, I have already shared my screen. So am, am I uh, audible? Yeah. Everything is okay? Yes, yes. Uh, so, do slides here. Now, uh, is it okay? Uh, are you able to see my screen? Can you use the full screen? Full screen, if you can use it, is good. Slide show. Slide show, I have done already. If it is not coming, you go ahead. Because we should not lose time. So, uh, is it, is my slide moving? It's not moving. Now, is it okay? Yeah, it's yeah. moving. Uh, it is moving. It is moving. Okay, okay. So, uh, <clears throat> good morning. Uh, now, I, I am going to talk about the swapping of the Pacific and Atlantic Nino influences on the north central india summer monsoon and these are my uh, co-authors uh, so uh, actually uh, i have taken these two subdivisions of india one is east uh, uttar pradesh and another is bihar and these two are very populated uh, regions of india and also very uh, fertile land and uh, uh, this is the rainfall index which i have plotted so here you can see that uh, this rainfall is uh, decreasing after this uh, is continuously decreasing and in recent decades that decrease is much steeper so there is a uh, paper and uh, studies that have shown that uh, the revival of monsoon has already taken place since uh, 2002 but here in this part of uh, this part in this region this uh, the revival of monsoon has not taken place means there is a continuous decrease in this rainfall over this region so now here uh, I have uh, correlated with, uh, I have detended this time series and then I have correlated and this, uh, these plots are showing uh, 
and this contour, uh, contours are mean sea level pressure, the setting is uh, sea surface temperature and uh, these arrows are lower tropospheric wind. So here you can see that uh, mm, uh, this correlation pattern shows uh, similar to this lamina type pattern. So I have uh, taken these two box, one over this uh, equatorial Pacific and another over this, this represents this uh, South uh, Tropic, uh, South Pacific convergence zone. And uh, for the upper troposphere, you can see this represents this uh, mm, circumglobal teleconnection pattern. And, uh, uh, and I have considered these two boxes. These two boxes are uh, uh, not very correlated with each other. They are very poorly correlated, but, uh, and, uh, because of these two positive and negative dipoles, this, uh, these winds are not sterilis over this region. And here you can see these winds are also sterilis, which are converging over this north, uh, north central India. So because of this means at, uh, at the lower troposphere, these winds are uh, pumping this uh, moisture towards this region. And at the, at the uh, upper troposphere also these winds are sterile. So basically they are decreasing the wind shear over this region. And also at the upper troposphere, these winds are coming from land. So they are uh, cold and dry. While this, uh, the winds at the lower troposphere, they are warm and moist. So when this, these two winds interact over this region, so at the upper troposphere, these winds are cold and dry. So, so they are heavier and uh, the winds at the lower troposphere, these are moist and warm. So these winds will sink and consequently these winds, uh, it will uh, rise, um, make this wind to rise. And this actually uh, uh, intensive, will intensify the convection over this region. So, so I, uh, I have taken this dipole pattern. I have taken, um, I have extracted the uh, data over this, these two boxes. And then I, I have made this uh, dipole uh, index. And here also I have extracted the data over these two boxes and I have uh, made this dipole. And here you can see that uh, uh, the geopotential dipole is very well correlated with this uh, north central India rainfall. <clears throat> so, uh, uh, okay, so and uh, this dipole pattern over this tropical Pacific dipole means uh, which I have constructed. So, this is the blue curve. So, here you can see that uh, uh, this, uh, this is very well correlated before uh, this late 70s to late 50, late 40, and in the recent decades, that correlation has weakened. So, so I have divided the time series into two, uh, two parts, uh, before 90, uh, late 1970s and after late 70s, just to see that why this, uh, this, this relationship has decreased in the recent decades. So uh, then I plotted the same, uh, same figure here. Uh, the settings are SST and uh, uh, this, uh, these contours are upper troposphere geopotential height. So in the, in the, uh, in, in the previous, uh, previous uh, period one, uh, before late 70s, this, uh, uh, this dipole pattern uh, is, uh, is already there. And in the, uh, in period two after late 70s, you can see that this this uh, correlation has decreased. And also uh, new distinct type of correlation pattern have emerged over this uh, Atlantic region. And this is uh, the subtropical uh, Atlantic dipole uh, mode. So, so in, the, uh, in the earlier period means this, uh, this dipole was more prominent while in the recent decades, this new dipole pattern has emerged. And also over this, uh, uh, at the upper troposphere, uh, this geopotential height, you can see this box uh, is showing significant correlation while in, in the latter period, in the recent period, this box is more, uh, more correlated. <clears throat> so 
uh, I have tried to mm, this. Uh, we have tried to find out that why this is happening. Again, means uh, uh, I have taken uh, I have extracted the data over this period and uh, and uh, <clears throat> constructed this dipole pattern, and uh, then I have plotted again this uh, twenty one year sliding correlation. So this is the blue line which we have seen already, and this red line is uh, subtropical Atlantic dipole. So you can see that in the uh, in the earlier period when when this tropical Pacific dipole was more significant uh, having uh, was having more significant correlation. That time, this uh, this uh, uh, subtropical Atlantic dipole uh, influence was not very strong. And in the recent decades, when uh, this Pacific dipole influence has weakened, that time uh, in this period, this south uh, subtropical Atlantic dipole uh, mode has become more prominent. And this green line is the correlation between this uh, TDP and SAG. Okay. So this is also going uh, along with this uh, subtropical Atlantic dipole. And this, uh, this uh, is the individual box which I've taken. So here you can see that uh, in the, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, the negative uh, over this uh, that curve is not actually behaving means uh, this um, uh, South Pacific uh, convergence zone is more prominent over this region than this uh, equatorial Central Pacific. So uh, to find out that why why this has happened, <coughs> we are uh, we have plotted this SST trend. So what we have seen that this uh, SST is rising all over this tropical region. So these are the boxes which I have taken. So here you can see this box is uh, negatively correlated with uh, uh, North Central India rainfall, and this is rising. This uh, this temperature is rising. So, so that may be the reason that why this uh, this influence is decreasing uh, over this region. While over this region, you can see this uh, tropical SSTs are increasing, and this box is actually representing this uh, Atlantic Atlantic Nino. And here, the background SST is is much higher. So, this rise in temperature over this region will influence uh, influence the general circulation pattern. And that's why uh, this, this uh, uh, dipole has came into picture. Here also this SST is rising, but the background SST is less than 20 degree centigrade. So, uh, so rise in temperature means uh, a few degree will not influence, will, will not have influence over uh, this general circulation pattern. So this may be the, uh, and here the SST is, um, uh, so, so this is the reason why it means this, uh, uh, there is a swapping in the uh, relationship of the, uh, that Pacific uh, uh, Nino is going down and this Atlantic Nino uh, is coming up in, in the recent decades. So, uh, and then further, further, I have divided the time series into these two parts and to, to see that what, uh, why this relationship has decreased for this uh, uh, tropical Pacific dipole. So this is for, for, for period one. So here you can see that uh, uh, this dipole pattern is there and this is for uh, period two. So here you can see that uh, in period two, the warming over this Atlantic Nino has also, uh, also came into picture. And here, most of these tropical, uh, tropical SSTs are cooler, is showing cool uh, negative anomaly. And because of that, this tropospheric height uh, has decreased. And uh, we have seen that here, this box, this uh, geopotential height is uh, favorable for this North India, uh, North, Central, North Central India rainfall. And this is the reason for that. And over this region, uh, that positive uh, geopotential height is not influenced. Is it, is not affected, but he uh, in the recent decades because this SST warming is much more over this tropical uh, SST. This uh, warming, which was restricted up to this Wampur region, has 
been expanded over uh, up to this Indian Ocean and here over Atlantic also it is showing uh, warm SST. Uh, so because of this warm SST, it has raised the geopotential height. Of, uh, so so uh, what this negative uh, geopotential height we are seeing over here that has decreased. And this positive geopotential height has increased over this north northwest of India, which is favorable for this north central India rainfall. And that is because of this warm SST over this tropical Atlantic that has uh, increased this geopotential height over uh, these two region and um, over this region. The same, in, uh, then here uh, we have this uh, done the partial correlation of 21 year moving window. Uh, for um, by the, uh, removing the influence of uh, uh, this uh, Atlantic uh, uh, Atlantic dipole uh, over this uh, uh, over this blue curve, and here we have uh, removed the influence of tropical Pacific dipole. So here again, you can see that uh, we are getting the similar picture, and both are influencing. Uh, both are means when one was active, then another was uh, was uh, not that much uh, was inactive. While you can see the same opposite uh, type of pattern here. here. Now uh, the same analysis we have done for this Atlantic dipole. So here also uh, this is for period one. So uh, here again you can see that uh, here, uh, in the period one when that. SST was not very warm over this region. That influence was not seen over this uh, north uh, northwest of India. When this uh, influence so the the SST was much warmer, and uh, this uh, Pacific uh, Nino uh, Pacific Nino uh, was also uh, is also uh, came into picture. Here you can see that. Uh, please stop in one minute. White has came to. Yes, sir. So we have done uh, this uh, model experiment and we have uh, given this uh, three type of experiment uh, with this uh, SST over this region. And you can see that uh, when we have given this uh, Pacific dipole mode uh, uh, warming. So here you can see that negative geopotential height uh, was there. And when we have given this Atlantic dipole warming, so this, uh, this wave type patterns are generated over this region about this uh, Eurasian region. And when we have given both this, so here you can see this standing wave. And because of this, um, and here you can see the same pattern. You where, can conclude, please. OK. So uh, so, the, so more you can just uh, go through my paper, this climate dynamics. Thank you. OK, thank you, Ramesh. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Now, may I request uh, Dr. Anu Mahajan, any one question? Sure. I, I, I see there's nothing on the Q&A thing. But Ramesh, uh, first of all, excellent work. It's very interesting to see how the ASA exchange of, of energy plays a huge role on, on monsoon precipitation over India. Uh, so one thing which I, I can see is and uh, as you have rightly pointed out, is it's definitely changing. Uh, uh, this change earlier seemed to be in sync. So uh, if you show your plot across the uh, across the time, it seemed to be that the Atlantic and Pacific dipoles were in sync, but now they are falling out of sync. Is this a signature of climate change, or do you think it is just they just have very different frequencies, and hence they are not matching anymore? Uh, actually, sir. Uh, there is a major climatic shift uh, we have observed after late 70s. And also this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, tropical SSTs have warmed. So because of this uh, climate shift and other uh, these things, these new features have come, this, this Atlantic Nino, you know, which was not, uh, not very active because that SST was not much warmer uh, earlier. But now, because of warming of this tropical SSTs, this has came into picture. So this is pretty bad news in terms of the future, uh, as I understand. Uh, especially the the IGP area is going to get lower and lower rainfall. Am I right in understanding that? 
Yeah, means uh, actually uh, already means people have shown that uh, uh, that monsoon has revived after uh, 2002. But but that reason which uh, that uh, uh, indo gagetic plane, especially over this eastern UP and Bihar, they are still means uh, following that uh, decreasing trend. So so uh, means uh, that has to be studied more. But uh, but what we have seen that because of this tropical warming. Uh, that region is um, means getting subdued rainfall activities. Right. No, thank you for that. It's, I have to admit, it's pretty amazing to see the role that the oceans can play in terms of changing things over continents. Uh, it's, uh, it's fascinating work. We'll come back to this. So please stick around for the discussion towards the end. But because we are short of time, we'll move on with the next uh, speaker for now. Thank you, Ramesh. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. May I request the next speaker, Dr. Srivardhan Pulswa. His talk uh, title is Understanding Bimethyl Sulfide and its Flux from the Southern Ocean. Dr. Pulswa, yes. please. Yes, uh, am I audible? And visible? You're audible. You're audible. I'll just share the screen. Yes. Yeah, is the screen visible? Yes, visible. Yeah. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. I am Srivardhan. I'll discuss briefly about our recently published uh, global sea surface climatile, uh, climatology, which we call the MSRF3, uh, thanks to the SOLAS uh, meetings and interactions, for which helped a lot in creation of this climatology. Uh, I'll present some of our uh, preliminary observations from the Southern Ocean. Uh, after I explain the DMS, how it works. Well, DMS, as we know, it's a biogenic trace gas produced over the uh, surface of the world oceans, uh, potentially significant in determining the Earth's radiation budget because of its ability to form sulfate aerosols, uh, contributing to CCN, etc. Therefore, the study of DMS uh, production and loss, uh, the factors affecting it, and the variability in DMS emissions from the ocean have uh, significant importance. So how do we do it? Either we parameterize the variability with respect to physical, chemical, or biological parameters, or what we call the top-down approach, or we use the in-situ uh, DMS concentrations measured during various uh, cruises, expeditions, etc. Put them together in a map and uh, showing its spatial and temporal variability, or what we call the bottom-up approach. Now here we have used the bottom-up approach and we created a, a database with about 873,000 plus points, uh, unevenly distributed spatially and temporarily. Uh, like for example, this map shows about 50 years of data, uh, in-situ data, which was uh, measured by older low spatial resolution, low frequency techniques and the recent high spatial resolution, high frequency techniques. Uh, now, putting these two kinds of data together will induce sampling bias. So we had to develop a new uh, data unification algorithm to put them together, which resulted in uh, 48,898 points, uh, the red dots that we see, but we still have the issue of uneven data distribution. So what they did before uh, in K99 or L11, the previous climatologies, was they used the static longest biogeochemical provinces uh, to handle the data distribution. But the biogeochemical properties of the sea surface have a seasonal variability. They are not static. Hence, we use the Regondo et al. Uh, by dynamic uh, biogeochemical provinces, which help us uh, incorporate the monthly variability of these uh, surface properties. So the data was split according to the months uh, and based on from where, uh, from which geo geographical location each data point uh, belongs, it was assigned a particular province uh, number for that particular month. Uh, on the right, we see that uh, not all provinces have a good amount of data. Some don't even have data. Some have one or two points. So we choose. Uh, so we chose uh, provinces with uh, data which showed biogeochemical similarities uh, with those with fewer data points to fill in the blanks. But we still had uh, provinces with uh, data gaps. So we chose to uh, interpolate them and complete the trend for to obtain data for every month for every province. 
This newly formed data set was returned to its original geographic location based on uh, the dynamic provinces, resulting in this first guess map, which has an unnatural distribution. We need to smoothen this out. So we incorporated this uh, concept of variability length scale or the distance for, over the surface where we do not expect uh, DMS value to change drastically. Uh, the previous climatology, L11, it used 555 kilometers or five degrees as a smoothing length. Uh, but then we had uh, a due, uh, about six studies which uh, studied VLS of DMS, which showed that that it changes from around 50 kilometers uh, near the equator to less than 10 kilometers in the polar region. So based on these uh, six studies, we had uh, data for around 11 provinces, which was then used to predict VLS for the, the other 45 provinces to create this map of VLS distribution. Now this was used as a weight for a weighted average interpolation of the, the first guess uh, map to get the map on the left which is without uh, sea ice. <clears throat> now we use the monthly sea ice climatology for masking this uh, uh, area with sea ice cover greater than 50%. And, and we get these two uh, more realistic maps, uh, which has much more acceptable uh, variability as compared to the first guess map. Now we see here uh, specifically that uh, the region south of 60 South has the highest concentrations of uh, DMS with prominent peaks in the high productivity region. Uh, the region is mostly under ice in the, during the austral summer. So the value corresponds to the, a smaller region, uh, which is outside the uh, sea ice cover, which is exposed and outside the sea ice cover. Now, based on the ice mask that we applied, we see the coastal Antarctica is completely under uh, ice cover. It does not contribute to the global mean DMS. Uh, for comparison, I have... Uh, the L11 on the left and our climatology on the right. Uh, uh, we see we have taken care of the spottiness in the L11 and given a more realistic distribution. Averaging that, we get the one with sea ice and one without sea ice. The one with sea ice, we see that there are some artifacts in the Southern Ocean along the coastal Antarctica. And uh, the, the thing is, different months have different uh, extents of sea ice. And when we take just an average of the entire thing, we see that unusual variability. So we applied uh, an annual climatology to, and we got rid of those artifacts, but we lost uh, some data coverage in the coastal region. So now we have three options. We can use the one without sea ice, the one with simple averaging, or uh, this uh, with loss of some Antarctic, uh, coastal Antarctic region. So what difference did uh, Rep3 make as compared to the previous uh, climatology? Uh, we have massive differences, uh, the one that occur on monthly and a regional scale. Uh, annually, if you uh, look, the differences might sound that they're not that uh, high, but if, uh, if you see the monthly differences, we can see that in the polar region, especially in the Southern Ocean region, mainly because now more data is available as compared to the previous years, we have uh, very high differences, both uh, positive and negative differences are seen in this region during the summer months and the rest of the year it's negligible. <clears throat> now to estimate the sea to air flux, we use Nightingale et al parameterization and based on this we see that the entire uh, region south of 30 south uh, seems to be a significant source of uh, DMS during the southern summer. The Southern Ocean seems to be a significant source of uh, DMS overall. And if you see the Indian sector of Southern Ocean is uh, a bit higher in, in the sense. <clears throat> it seems so. Now N00, the Nightingale et al, uh, it's an older parameterization. So we are currently looking in, uh, into updating this uh, number as uh, using the newer parameterizations or which one works more efficiently to see what difference does it make and in the overall estimation of uh, sulfate aerosol, CCN concentration, and uh, atmospheric coursing, et cetera. Uh, to conclude, the most significant changes are observed in the range of almost 50 to uh, minus 50 to 100% in the Southern Ocean region, mainly because it was undersampled in the past and the highest differences seen in the month of November. 
uh, we need to characterize the CI's interaction with uh, with BMS because we know that it is not zero in the coastal Antarctic. We have zero uh, emissions or zero uh, sea surface BMS concentration for all the region which has more than fifty percent sea ice. We know it's not the wave, so we need to characterize this uh, better. This. Uh, the significant differences are during only the summer months with the peak in November and the rest of the time it's uh, it's negligible. And it would be safe to say that the positive differences in the Southern Ocean would mean that all the previous studies that used L11 uh, surface uh, climate BMS values uh, in the Southern Ocean region might possibly have a, a underestimation. Uh, this is the publication and we look forward to seeing what improvements Rev3 has on understanding the state of uh, Southern Ocean atmosphere. <clears throat> These are the references. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ulspa. Nice presentation. Now may I request Dr. Uh, Anu Pahini Puri. Thank you. Uh, a reminder to everyone saying that the Q&A box is open. If you have any questions put in into any of the studies, we can answer one quick question after every talk. And by the end of it, we'll have a proper discussion. I see Dr. Rahul Mohan has his hand up. So please go ahead and ask your question. Okay. So I have one query. Can I ask? Uh, sorry, uh, Dr. Rahul Mohan had his hand up first. Uh, okay, okay. Maybe yeah. maybe you can ask it after him. After, after, later I'll ask. Uh, it's not a query. I I felt that uh, this study very clearly indicates that you need more in situ data sets. Uh, yes. That's so critical. Once you say that you have a small set of months that you have DMS, such huge patches all over the Southern Ocean, and then you see the rest of the year, it's just going down. So I feel that uh, that's so critical. So this study again emphasizes what we have been talking in the Southern Ocean decade work groups, that uh, we need an integrated sort of collection uh, from the world over scientists who are working in Southern Ocean. That's my take, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Shall I ask my query now or later? No, please go ahead. Okay. So actually, you know that uh, this is the scenario of uh, global warming. So a lot of melting is happening in the Southern Ocean region. We know that. Especially from 2016 onwards, the sea ice formation is getting drastically reduced. So how it is affecting the DMS variation? Is any contribution from that side? That is what, that, because you are telling that sea ice formation where sea ice is there, it is less. And where sea ice is not there, it is more. Like that, you have informed, you have given the information. So my question is. Well, right now it's it's like, uh, we have used a very basic uh, kind of cutoff for sea ice mask. Like it's less than 50%, we have 100% DMS concentration. It's more than 50%, it's zero. So we know it doesn't interact that way. We have a uh, kind of uh, episodic, uh, outbursts of this DMS flux in, in sea ice region. So this needs to be characterized properly. After that, we will be able to pinpoint as to uh, like how the changing sea ice uh, cover is affecting the DI, uh, DMS uh, concentrations and the flux. So I think that step needs to be answered first or at least addressed first. Okay, thank you. Great. Uh, just to add on to that, uh, Dr. Ankumar, one of the things, I think a short answer to your question is we don't know, uh, yeah. mainly because uh, there are new observations which are coming through mm -hmm. and they're showing that maybe the sea ice areas are actually a pretty large source of DMS. Mm -hmm. uh, until now, it was thought that it would not be a source. So uh, maybe it is in certain parts of sea ice areas are, are actually a larger source than open oceans, mm -hmm. but we honestly don't have a concrete answer to that but hopefully in the future we will and uh, and you know getting more observations as as uh, dr rahul mohan mentioned is 
crucial to this. So, I mean, considering NCPR is working so much on this, I suggest uh, investing in a SIMS instrument because uh, that will really help with the Indian sector. I see uh, uh, Bhaskar, uh, who was, as I mentioned, involved in this Indian Southern Ocean program, has asked, uh, Sri, if you can answer this very quickly, DMS measurements in the Indian Southern Ocean uh, or the Indian sector of the Southern Ocean are lacking. What is the difference between the different sectors with respect to the DMS flux? Well, uh, based on the the, the the slide that I showed before, it, I, can I share it again? Please go ahead. Uh, just a minute. Uh, can you see this uh, slide? Here? Yes, yes, go ahead. Yeah. So, we see that in in the that actually in in the southern summer the december Jan, the november december january this period the indian sector of uh, southern ocean is one of the major contributors of uh, dms flux so well did i answer the question <laughs> <laughs> yes i think so uh, one however i think we should mention a caveat saying that because there are very few observations, this could possibly just be a, a mathematical error. We don't know. We we need some yeah. observations over there. Yeah. But also, all hints uh, point to it being a very large source. Yeah. Also, uh, we have used the older uh, parameterization, uh, the N004, uh, calculating the DMS flux based on uh, REP3. So we are currently looking in uh, like almost seven different parameterizations to see how this uh, number is changing or which one is the more accurate I one. I think we can take a detailed discussion at the end of the session. Sounds good. If All right, Shri so, uh, will continue at the end. Yeah, thank you. Let me stop. Okay. Shall we go to the next presentation? Yes, please. Okay. Next presentation is by Soleha Inamdar. Atmospheric iodine chemistry in Southern Ocean marine boundary layer. Inamdar, please. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'll just start sharing my screen now. Yes. Okay. I hope everything is visible here. Yes, fine. Okay, so uh, my topic is uh, atmospheric iodine chemistry in Southern Ocean Marine Boundary Layer. I will try to focus on the air sea interaction uh, criteria of it. Okay. Yeah, so basically, uh, how does iodine enter into the atmosphere? It starts with sea surface iodide or uh, iodine that is uh, dissolved in the water in terms of iodide or iodate. It reacts with the ozone on the surface of uh, the ocean and it leads to the formation of uh, HOI and I2, which are the inorganic iodine fluxes. They quickly react, uh, they get photolyzed and release uh, elemental iodine, which again reacts with the ozone to form iodine oxide. Iodine oxide can further go ahead and uh, undergo self reactions to form higher oxide iodine oxide particles and lead to the formation of cloud condensation nuclei, ultimately affecting the radiation budget. So this slide simply shows the importance of uh, iodine in atmosphere and how its exchange from the ocean to atmosphere takes place. So uh, like I had mentioned before that there are these two sources, HOI and I2 for uh, iodine and atmosphere, but there are also some organic sources like methyl iodide, ethyl, uh, CH2, I2, et cetera. And uh, this shows the same process where these lead to the formation of elemental iodine reacts with not just with ozone, but there are other reactions with uh, OH and HO2, which leads to the formation and uh, changes to the oxidation capacity of the atmosphere and ultimately to formation of higher iodine oxide particles and aerosols. 
so why do we need to study iodine chemistry or why the air sea exchange of iodine from the ocean to atmosphere is important uh, it is because of these three main factors first like i mentioned it changes the oxidation capacity of the atmosphere because it reacts with the hydroxyl radical second because uh, it changes uh, it causes a tropospheric ozone depletion by around 16% and also affects the radiation budget by particle formation so to understand the iodine chemistry uh, the community is now dependent is dependent on some parametric equations the fluxes that i had mentioned of inorganic iodine that is i2 and hoi they are calculated and not really measured there are very few studies uh, very recent studies who have done measurements of hoi but mostly uh, the models end up using these parametric equations given by carpenter et al in 2013 uh if you uh, focus on these equations uh this highlights that you need a concentration of sea surface iodide uh there are some problems in the measurement or the observation of sea surface iodide so these are also parameterized and there are these two famous parametric equations for sea surface iodide concentration uh, estimation and if you look at the last one which is highlighted as macdonald et al 2014 so this is the parametric equation which is an arrhenius expression which says that the sea surface iodide concentration is roughly inversely proportional to the sea surface temperature and this is the equation which is famously used by most of the uh, global models uh, that try to estimate uh, iodine atmospheric iodine chemistry uh, now why this is problematic is because uh, the parametric equations are based from data sets uh, which do not include the indian ocean or the indian sector of the southern ocean so as you can see that this is a compilation of all of the sea surface iodide observations uh, and this compilation was done by chance et al 2014 uh, it shows that this region with that i have highlighted here is completely blank and there was no information from here now uh, this is a plot of uh, of of uh, of all the observations of atmospheric iodine that is iodine oxide from prados roman et al 2015 and even here uh, there is a very similar situation that the indian ocean sector and the uh, the the indian ocean and the uh, southern ocean the indian sector of the southern ocean are uh, blank and there are missing observations i'm sorry that i'm fumbling a little it's very late here it's almost midnight uh, now since i had mentioned about the atmospheric i moved from the ocean uh, I, iodine to uh, the atmospheric iodine oxide so i want to highlight that how the those measurements are done because uh, as a part of my phd we were successful in measuring iodine oxide in the indian ocean and the southern ocean region and we also obtained the first observations of sea surface iodide so there is this state of the art instrument called as the multi axis differential absorption optical absorption spectroscopy uh, which uh, was involved in the measurement of atmospheric iodine oxide so this is a schematic explaining the simple working principle of the geometry of the instrument uh, where uh there is basically uh, an observation of the scattered light in terms of spectra and the absorption uh in that spectra is characteristic to different various atmospheric uh, compounds and that is how uh from spectra we get the information of volume mixing ratio of iodine oxide in atmosphere a simple explanation here uh you can see the setup of the maxwell instrument on the southern ocean cruise uh, the sa abul has at uh, so there is this is how the telescope looks like the side view of the telescope and actually the prism in the telescope which is which is all rotated on a motor for different elevation angles like it was shown in the schematic and it has an indoor unit which has a spectroscope uh, which has a spectrometer a uv and visible spectrometer and a data acquisition system roughly here is the location of the instrument on the ship which is which requires a clear line line of view and uh, no obstructions in the instrument uh, viewing direction as i had mentioned that uh, 
as a part of my PhD, uh, we were able to obtain the measurements of iodine oxide from different sources. So it was the IOE2 and uh, all the Indian Southern Ocean expeditions starting from 8 to 11, we were able to successfully measure iodine oxide on these cruises and complete that missing gap, which I had shown before that the Indian Ocean and Southern Ocean region were not explored in terms of iodine chemistry. So Hello? after, sorry. So after uh, these expeditions, uh, this is how this the region that I had highlighted before looks like. We not only obtained the iodine oxide measurements, but we were able to obtain on one of our expedition, the SOE-9, this is first observation of sea surface iodide. And there was also some studies that involved analysis of water samples from the Bobble and Sagar Kanya cruise which was helpful in developing a uh, parameterization for the sea surface iodide. Like I mentioned before, the existing parameterization did not include this region of our study. So we wanted to develop a new region specific parameterization. I have not shown it here, but I want to focus on the results because the parameterization of sea surface iodide is used in calculating the fluxes. Sorry. So what I want to highlight here is that these are the fluxes of I2 and HOI, but if you look at the observed iodine oxide concentration, the fluxes don't really explain the observed iodine oxide concentration. So this highlights uh, a major question that we uh, do not understand the iodine chemistry in terms of the inorganic iodine fluxes yet, or maybe we do not understand how exactly the air sea interaction plays a role into this. And there are some, this definitely highlights a need for the observation of these fluxes rather than having parametric equations or improvement of these parametric equations. Another interesting thing that was noted was that uh, when we did a correlation of the atmospheric iodine oxide with other parameters like wind speed, ozone, SSP, chlorophyll, etc., uh, there was a very strong correlation observed with the uh, the chlorophyll A concentration, which also shows that uh, highlights that it's not just the inorganic aspect of iodine uh, precursors, but also there could be a biogenic control that may play a role in the observed iodine chemistry because from the previous plot, it is clear that iodine oxide was ubiquitously present in this region. And uh, this explains that, uh, this highlights that it is not just inorganic, but also the organic uh, iodine precursor that may play a role. So I guess uh, I am close to my conclusion. And uh, to conclude, I would say that uh, as a part of the study to understand more about the air sea interaction of uh, iodine, uh, we were uh, able to do several, we were able to participate on several ship-based expeditions, which were organized by the NCPOR and the Ministry of Earth Sciences for the first observations of iodine oxide and concomitant observations of uh, ozone and sea surface iodide were obtained from previously undersampled region. And uh, there was a improvement made for the existing parameterization for the inorganic iodine precursors. And we found that they do not really match the observed iodine oxide levels, indicating that there is a need for observations. Uh, we also developed a new region-specific parameterization for sea surface iodide uh, and to, in order to improve the fluxes, but that really did not help. And I did not highlight the model aspects, but I did show I had some plots here. And finally, I would just comment that the model simulation of uh, iodine oxide, they match with the observed levels, but they have a large offset. This indicates that the inorganic chemi chemistry or the inorganic uh, iodine fluxes, they do drive some part of the iodine chemistry, but that is not the whole picture. So thank you. And I am open to questions. Thank you, Dr. Ramtar, for finishing your presentation time. And now I hand over to for any questions. Thank you. Uh, so Swaleha, there are two questions uh, which we can take mm -hmm. and then we can take the others uh, towards the end. Uh, one is a uh, question which uh, you should be able to answer in terms of uh, the basic knowledge is, uh, in Antarctica, there is very little human activity, but why mm -hmm. does ozone depletion occur over Antarctica? Okay. <laughs> I will try to answer this question. 
um that is basically because of the iodine chemistry because like i mentioned that iodine acts as a sink for tropospheric ozone and whatever little ozone that reaches antarctica gets depleted because of the heterogeneous chemistry involving iodine i guess yeah, I, I mean, it's not just iodine, there's iodine and bromine. It depends on which part of the atmosphere you're yeah. looking at it. If it is stratospheric, then it is mostly driven by uh, chlorofluorocarbons. And, and if it is tropospheric, then you're looking at bromine and iodine catalytic reactions. But basically, it's halogen chemistry, which drives halogen ozone chemistry. depletion uh, in, in the polar regions. Uh, Katie has asked uh, whether the correlation between your iodine concentrations or iodide concentrations and chlorophyll were based on in-situ chlorophyll measurements or uh, was it based on regional or satellite observations? Okay, thank you for your question, Katie. Uh, the correlation was between the observed atmospheric iodine oxide and uh, obs observations of chlorophyll A, surface chlorophyll A concentration. I also had a correlation with the satellite uh, chlorophyll A concentrations from MODIS, uh, but that did not actually show that positive, strong positive correlation. It was from the observations that we could see that strong positive correlation between the iodine oxide and chlorophyll A. Great, thank you. I think we'll uh, now move on and uh, and we'll come back to the discussion because there are okay. a few comments uh, later. Thank you. So shall, shall we go for the next uh, presentation? Yes, please. Or, yeah, so next uh, presentation. Hey, MRD John. So the topic is lipid biomarkers of marine phytoplankton variability in modern snow and marine sediments from southwestern Rose Sea, Latvia. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Emma de Jong. Um, I just want to say a big thank you to the conveners of today's session. I'm very excited to be giving um, a talk about my uh, project. I'm only three to four months into my master's, so um, this is a wonderful opportunity. And um, today I'll just be talking about what I'm doing and why, and then some uh, preliminary results. So, uh, sorry, just first, my um, I'll present. I'll be presenting on um, some insights into the southwestern Ross Sea phytoplankton from um, snow and marine sediments. So the Southern Ocean accounts for around 25% of the oceanic uptake of atmospheric carbon dioxide, despite it only making up 10% um, of the total ocean surface area. So it's taking up sort of more than its fair share. And a really big part of this is uh, primary production and the formation of phytoplankton through photosynthesis. And this is incredibly important for the global carbon cycle as phytoplankton act as a, um, a significant carbon sink. So phytoplankton um, are also important because they support the complex marine food web that is in the surrounding Southern Ocean waters, um, including the unique ecosystem in the Ross Sea, which is uh, my study area. Um, and then another reason that phytoplankton are important is that they um, also release cloud nucleating biogenic emissions into the atmosphere. So my study area, the Ross Sea, um, which is where I've got this uh, green box is one of the most productive uh, areas in the world. So this is another image just zoomed in on that um, box in the, on the left. And these black areas are, are polynias, so ice-free areas. And uh, this is Ross Island here. And then this is McMurdo Station. And then the sea ice is breaking up over here. Um, and then this is the Ross Ice Shelf. So this area in particular uh, of the Ross Sea is super productive in summer due to the breakup of sea ice. Um, there's also an increase in light, nutrients and temperature, which all lead to um, more productivity. So there are three polynias in the Ross Sea that open up in summer. The Ross Sea polynia, uh, which where the bloom starts in early November, and then continues through to February, and it's dominated by 
Haptophytes and Phaeocetus Antarctica. And then the McMurdo, McMurdo Sound and Terranova Bay open up a little bit later and are dominated by diatoms. So currently, the main source of information on past prime production rates um, are derived from chlorophyll A pigments, which are picked up by satellites. So on the right here, we have uh, that same coastline, uh, the same image of that same coastline. And these uh, green parts are chlorophyll A captured from space. Um, so satellite imagery started in 1979, but records have been discontinuous. So continuous records of primary production and phytoplankton are actually much shorter. Um, so what this means is that um, current predictions about the future of phytoplankton change and the future of primary production uh, are quite varied. There's not a whole lot of agreement and there's not very conclusive uh, predictions. And this is because we need at least a few hundred to a thousand years to put recent changes into context. So we wanna make some longer records and longer records would um, increase our knowledge about past CO2 uptake in the ocean, allowing us to make more informed predictions about the future. Longer records would also increase our understanding of the unique ecosystems in the Ross Sea region, and they would, it would help to better characterize the composition of biogenic emissions uh, to the atmosphere. So one method that could uh, help with this is lipid biomarkers. So biomarkers are complex organic molecules derived from formerly living organisms that are preserved in natural archives, such as sediment cores and ice cores. And fatty acids are the acidic part of these biomarkers, and they are a major component of the lipids in some species such as microalgae. So um, this is an example of a fatty acid with a C16 carbon chain. And fatty acids and biomarkers are a very well-established proxy in marine sediments, and they are um, an exciting new emerging proxy in ice cores. So this is just a figure of how past phytoplankton changes can be recorded in natural archives. So we have a phytoplankton bloom here in the middle, and microorganisms and their remains from the bloom can sink to the sea floor and accumulate in marine sediments. So things like diatom fossils have been used to track changes in past time production. Um, however, fatty acids are another proxy that are present in sediments and provide an opportunity to uh, recreate changes as well. Uh, phytoplankton blooms also emit biogenic emissions to the atmosphere, um, and then they are transported uh, through the atmosphere and then can be deposited in the nearby ice pack alongside marine and sea ice uh, aerosols. They can then be preserved in the ice and then they act as like a natural archive of uh, past biogenic emissions that the ice cores do. So currently there are no common proxies uh, for primary production between sediment and ice cores. Um, and the ocean to atmosphere to snow transfer of fatty acids is actually largely unexplored in the Ross Sea or even wider Antarctica. But fatty acids show uh, great promise in reconstructing past primary production in ice cores as shown uh, by a fatty acid record from a subantarctic island by King et al. Uh, they found that a particular uh, fatty acid, oleic acid, correlated well with MSA, which is another pro primary production pro proxy, and both MSA and oleic acid correlate well with our sea ice concentration records. Um, yeah, so for my project, I expect the concentration of biomarkers to reflect the dominant phytoplankton type in proximal ocean waters. So for example, if our samples come from near Terranova Bay, I expect the samples to reflect uh, diatoms because that's the, the, the dominant species. So the overall aim of my project is to investigate present day spatial distributions of fatty acid biomarkers related to phytoplankton in the Ross Sea to help interpret longer paleoclimate records of phytoplankton. And the first objectives, which I'll show some preliminary results of today, is to explore uh, the phytoplankton communities in the Ross Sea by determining the concentration um, 
of phytoplankton biomarkers in sediment, snow, and seawater samples. After that, I'll identify common biomarkers between samples for direct comparison. Then I'll identify the source regions of these lipid biomarkers, and I'll compare spatial trends of these biomarkers uh, with chloral, chlorophyll A and C ice concentration satellite data. So just to resituate you, I'm talking about the southwestern coast of the Ross Sea here when I zoom in. Um, and my samples come from um, along the southwestern coast. I have snow samples in red, um, shallow marine sediment cores in green, and then um, my seawater samples in orange or yellow up here. Um, and the red circles are snow samples that I've already analyzed that I'll be presenting on today. Uh, so quick, quickly, I'll go over the methods. Uh, you extract the biomarkers from your sample. You use um, columns to separate them into three fractions. You have your acidic fraction, which contains your fatty acids, and you measure it on the GCMS. And these are just some photos of me in the lab. And then this one is me in the New Zealand ice core facility uh, preparing some snow samples. So I have some snow samples, re which represent a year's worth of snowfall and then also atmospheric deposition of biomarkers in 2010. So I've just zoomed in again. Um, we're going to start off with these three samples here. And these are chromatograms that come off the GCMS and they illustrate the different biomarker distributions in the samples. So this result is showing that there are uh, phytoplankton biomarkers present in these snow samples. Um, we've got some algae biomarkers, we've got some bacteria biomarkers and some diatom biomarkers. We've also got a super intense uh, C22 to one double bond uh, peak, which is very intense. And um, we're still confirming what this could be, but it's very exciting as it could be um, diatoms. Um, because that would make sense with the surrounding environment, but this is still to be confirmed. Um, so if we just whiz through the rest, they show similar um, distributions. There's some more C16, C18, and then that C22 to one. Um, again, there's another one, but this one has um, a more specific diatom um, biomarker. And then if we head down here to the, um, to Marble Point, um, we have some different results again, and there's just uh, some other biomarkers and some different ratios happening. Cool, and these results are consistent with uh, microscopic images of diatom fragments, um, which have been found in snow as well, and it's also consistent with what we know about phytoplankton and air mass trajectories. Uh, so there are very similar concentrations. So these green squares are just concentration. And then along these, this coastline again, um, so C16, this is algae, uh, an algae biomarker. We see very similar concentrations here and then here, but we have uh, one um, sample that has a concentration over four times higher than the other places, which could relate to wind patterns, but it was also an incredibly dusty sample. And we think that dust enhances biomarker concentrations as it gives the lipids something to stick to. Um, so this is something else that I'll explore later on in my thesis. Um, this is C18, so bac uh, bacteria, and the um, samples all look very similar again, even more similar apart from that marble point one. And the ones that are all next door to, to each other um, are almost exactly the same. So this is giving us a lot of confidence that they're undergoing the same process. So the takeaways are that there are a range of fatty acids that represent primary producers. There are varying concentrations spatially and the distributions of different fatty acids, they vary spatially between places as well. So just moving on to some quick next steps and future work. So uh, my priority is to finish my lab work. I've got some seawater particulates and then some snow from Terranova Bay, so further north. Uh, which I'll compare with my McMurdo sound results. And then I've also got those shallow sediment cores. Um, and a couple of those have uh, some temp, uh, have a depth profile as well. So I'll investigate the temporal um, variation. And then I'll investigate the sources of um, 
of the biomarkers as well. Um, and while outside of my the scope of my thesis, I'll also be heading down to the Southern Ocean uh, later on this year on the Tangaroa to um, sample, get some aerosol samples for biomarker work as well from the Southern Ocean and the Ross Sea. So just a quick conclusion. Um, there are sort of three takeaways. The first is that fatty acids show promise as an ice core proxy of primary production, as shown by the subantarctic islands and McMurdo Sound. Uh, two, the project will help to limit, uh, link the processes between biogenic emissions and then their incorporation into ice core archives. And then three, fatty acid biomarkers have the potential to act as a direct comparison between different environmental archives uh, for the first time, which is very exciting. Um, so some acknowledgement to the acknowledgements to the Roger Cooper Scholarship, GNS Science, and the Rutherford Foundation uh, and Victoria University of Wellington for um, supporting my thesis. Thank you. Thank you. Professor. So, uh, Anup, any query from anybody? Yeah, so uh, a reminder saying that the Q&A box is on. So if you have any questions, you can always ask over there. I see Dr. Rahul Mohan has his hand up. So please go ahead. Yeah, well, thank you so much uh, for a wonderful presentation. You are, you are into the initial innings and I hope that you will uh, work really well because biomarkers are very critical and important. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I hope that you will corroborate your biomarkers with microscopy results as well. So that's mm -hmm. my only suggestion to you. But overall, it uh, looks to be a robust study that you're looking at uh, sediment, water, and eye samples as well. So how long would be the sediment course? Any idea? Could you throw light on that? Um, so the like the longest core I've got is only um, 50 centimeters so it's pretty short so it's more just trying to come up with a um, you know a present day uh, signal so uh, I've got some dating done but I haven't managed to sort of finish that off so I'm not sure how old the cores are um, but we're hoping that it's representative of present day Again, uh, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, no, there was a question regarding the, Can we go to uh, the presentation. Yes, uh, connectivity issues. Yeah, I, I think we can move on. Emma, we have a few more questions, uh, but we'll come back to you uh, at the end of the uh, uh, end of the session during the discussion. Okay, thank you. Um, hi, good morning. Uh, yeah, is it audible? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, okay. Purmala. Ah, yes, sir. Just yeah, your topic is physical drivers on uh, high chlorophyll in the vicinity yes, of polar friend in the Indian sector of Southern Asia during the summer. Please go ahead. I hope my slide is visible. Okay. My presentation is visible, right? Ha Hello? Yes, yes, your presentation. Yeah. Uh, okay. Hi, good morning, all. I'm Nirmala from Ocean Sciences Group uh, from NCPR, Goa, India. And I will be presenting on the topic physical drivers on high chlorophyll A in the vicinity of the polar friend of the Indian Ocean sector of Southern Ocean during Austral summer. 
uh global warming is a hot topic nowadays and we know that carbon dioxide is the main causative reason for that and uh, oceans also major uh, ocean is a major sink for carbon dioxide carbon and among this southern ocean is the largest sink for anthropogenic carbon dioxide that is nearly 50 percentage of the carbon is absorbed by southern ocean and a major fraction of this carbon drawdown is done through photosynthesis um even though southern ocean is a uh, high no high nutrient low chlorophyll region uh, many phytoplankton blooms have been reported from uh, southern ocean and it is very important to study uh, these uh, phytoplankton blooms as they impact the biogeochemical cycle of the entire southern ocean um factors affecting the primary productivity in southern ocean compared with other oceans southern ocean uh, um, is having higher nutrients whereas uh, there is always low chlorophyll in southern ocean there are two limiting factors uh, which results in this uh, low chlorophyll that is the availability of sunlight and the scarcity of iron so uh, during summer time the, uh, there we can find uh, more uh, chlorophyll presence of more uh, phytoplankton and the main uh, iron supplying agents in southern ocean are wind advection meltwater eddies hydrothermal vent activities and antarctic shell sediments this figure shows the uh, climate chlorophyll climatology for the month of february for the marked uh, latitude and longitude and uh, here we can see in the uh, coastal regions uh, more uh, chlorophyll concentration is there but while we move towards the offshore region uh, the, uh, there we can see less chlorophyll concentration and here uh, we have marked uh, various trends across southern ocean and we have marked our steady area in the red box and uh, in that box you can see uh, majority of the box the chlorophyll concentration is very low uh, nearly it is up uh, to zero but we got a contrasting pattern while we observed the mori sakwa ocean color data uh, for chlorophyll and it was observed that in 2017 for the steady area we observed higher concentration of chlorophyll for both january and february and uh, we checked for 2018 and uh, the 18 was matching with the uh, climatological data so why this anomaly in uh, anomalous chlorophyll bloom in 2017 so in this the figure uh, top figure shows the uh, monthly Clim uh, climatology for the month of, uh, sorry monthly chlorophyll climatology for the month of february and here uh, if you say like uh, if you look at the right side of this plot you can see there is higher concentration of chlorophyll on the right side whereas uh, on the left side there is lower chlorophyll and uh, we checked that with the 2017 february uh, sorry we uh, we calculated the anomaly for chlorophyll a for 2017 february and it was observed that in the left side of this uh, area more uh, chlorophyll concentration was present and uh, we checked the same with various parameters uh, obtained from instruments mounted on ctd and it was observed that in uh, 2017 uh, these are various parameters we obtained from uh ctd mountain instruments that are uh, dissolved oxygen fluorescence and par that is photosynthetically active radiation and uh, if we compare uh, february 2017 and 2018 you can uh, if you uh, look at the green line for fluorescence that station passes over uh, the bloom area and uh, you can see that chlorophyll uh, the fluorescence is more in that area but uh, if uh, if you look at the par for the same it is observed that the par is very less compared to 2018 so we can say, uh, conclude that light was not a factor for the bloom in that area and we observed the lab obtained nutrient profiles and uh, it was observed that in 2017 all nutrients were abundant than in 2018 Uh, this is the sec uh, temperature section plot along 57.5 degree east uh, obtained from the uh, southern ocean expedition 2017 and 18 uh, here i have marked uh, various friends across uh, friends using sst criteria and uh, here you, uh, you can see in the top uh, top figure pf2 is marked pf2 is the polar friend to and uh, we can say like 3 to 2 degree celsius in uh, sst represent pf2 and uh, comparing with 2018 2017 polar friend was much wider and also if you observe uh, 
on the left hand left hand side you can see a darker blue color patch that is the winter water that is winter water is a remnant of uh winter before uh, this uh, observed time that is summer so uh, if you observe the winter water in both uh, 2017 and 18 2017's winter water was warmer than 2018's water so here uh, the water column itself is more buoyant sorry not the water column i mean the winter water is uh, much more buoyant so if any trigger in the surface can uplift this winter water uh, from subsurface to surface and this also might have contributed to the uh, higher concentration we observed in both satellite and uh, observation data set so uh, again we um, plot, uh, based on sst criteria we again uh, plotted uh, sorry mark polar friend 1 and 2 and in 2017 you can see polar friend uh, is more wider than 2018 so this might have brought warmer water from northern side towards coast and this might have um, triggered horizontal instability just like uh, already vertical instability was observed in the uh, water column and now the horizontal instability is also present there so we hope both of this might have uh, contributed to higher uh, chlorophyll and uh, in order to check whether there is any upwelling in this region we calculated ekman vertical ekman pumping using uh, era 5 wind data and uh, i overlay chlorophyll concentration from 0.5 to 1 over this and uh, in 2017 we can see that the ekman pumping was more wherever ekman pumping is more that area the chlorophyll production was more as compared to 2018 that is from uh, if you uh, see from 78 to 90 the ekman pumping was more in this region and the chlorophyll production was more in this region so we hope that even Ekman uh, pumping might have uh, contributed to this high chlorophyll. Again, uh, we checked uh, glory surface current and overlaid it over chlorophyll concentration. And it was observed that in 2017, the currents were a little bit stronger than 2018. This might have been due to, again, the shifting or widening of polar trend. And again, uh, we wanted to know, uh, we wanted to uh, check whether there is any eddy activities in this region. So, uh, using Okubovi's parameter, uh, uh, using Okubovi's parameter, we uh, find uh, found many uh, cyclonic and anticyclonic eddies in this region. And uh, in both region, 2017 and 18, uh, active eddies are present in this region. And if you see uh, to the top. Uh, northeast corner of this uh, area it is seen that more, more eddy activity is prominent in that region it is because uh, if you look at the current uh, data set you can see there is a i have a uh, contour uh, topography over there and the current is uh, like one current from south and one current from northeast interacting there and this might have been the reason for more eddy activities in this region and again uh, coming connecting to our high chlorophyll uh, region the eddies in 2017 are uh, more uh, cyclonic eddies are present in 2017, which might have been uh, which might have promoted upwelling, and this might have been the reason for uh, more presence of more chlor chlorophyll in the 2017. Summary: Anomalous chlorophyll A was observed in the year 2017 February. 2016 winter showed record sea ice minimum over Antarctica. Cruise observation showed the presence of warmer winter water in subsurface. Along with this, nutrient-rich waters were observed in the upper water column. Vertical as well as horizontal hydrographic structure shows the weak stratification. Analysis showed the active Ekman pumping along with the weak stratification might have contributed to the high productivity in the region. Also, the significant activity of both cyclonic and anticyclonic eddies might have also contributed to the high productivity. This study shows that warmer years may also have impact on the productivity in a region like ESO. Thank you. Thank you. Mala. Thank you. Uh, may I hand over to Anu for any questions? Thank you. Uh, Nirmala, there is a question in the Q&A for you from Rob uh, Masson. And uh, he's asking, uh, could different sea ice conditions also be a factor affecting the different chlorophyll patterns between the years? Actually, uh, 2017, uh, if you look at the winter, uh, like CIS extension for 2017, I mean 16, it was very, we recorded low CIS. 
so uh, already the presence of cis we can exclude like uh, if C, uh, whenever cis is there cis melting might contribute to iron and other nutrients but here cis was not there so we have to exclude cis presence of cis here okay thank you uh, we will come back to you towards the end uh, we just got thank one you. more presentation to go uh, dr anand kumar should we go ahead with this yeah so the next presentation is by Hello, my name is Gabriele Tavares. Gabriele, I am a student in the remote science Tavares. course so at the National Institute for Space Research Symbols. Welcome to my presentation on the analysis of CO2 fluxes variability in the Drake Passage. Introduction. Over the ocean, the supply of energy from the action of the wind generates a turbulent effect of the surface, making the wind one of the main responsible for the agitation of the sea and atmospheric forcing in the mixing processes of the interface. This atmospheric pressure and high temperature act directly and indirectly in the mixing process, as they are responsible for creating the gradient that generates wind, and this influences the concentration of CO2 in air and water. <clears throat> the flux of CO2 in the southern ocean occurs based on the balance between the natural carbon emission from deep waters that resurface at the surface, not absorbed be by bio biological process, and the human emission that drive the flux to the ocean, in which half and carbon capture occurs as water flux north from the surface layer to warm regions. Studies based on insight data taken from ships show a net absorption with climatological values of negative 0 0.8 and negative 1 pg c year indicating that the flow direction is from the atmosphere to the ocean. Objective. The objective of this study is quantify the flux of CO2 at the ocean atmosphere interface and from that analyze the variability of the fluxes. fluxes. Add the covariance method. The method used to classify, quantify the CO2 flux was the physical statistical method of vortex covariance, in which it is considered a direct method for obtaining meteorological parameter and gas concentration with high temporal frequency in the surface layer of the marine atmospheric boundary layer. And knowing that it's in the surface layer that the turbulent process occur, resulting from the transfer of momentum between the atmosphere and the ocean. This method measures the variation of turbulent fluctuation around the mean and mid density of dry air over a time interval. It has been used in several studies, which you can research later in the work of Raymond et al., who used it to describe CO2 fluxes, and the Oliver, who used it for the fugacity of CO2. Turbulent flow of CO2 is given in micromole m square s be the fluctuation of the vertical wind component and the mixing ratio H2O CO2 in relation to the averages and the average density of dry eye. 
Materials and Methods. The period worked was November 28 and 29, 2021, and January 30, 30, 2022 in which were the days that the ship was in the Drake Passage. The data used were from the ship, so before the flow quantification, a movement correction was performed due to the movement of the ship that ends up influencing the data results. The correction was based on the work B. Miller, Based on the equation by Fujitani, where the wind speed correction in the three component, components was made from accelerometer data, ship speed, and spectral filters. After that, the quantification of the CO2 flow was performed in the EDPRO software. Then the analysis of the results of the CO2 flow was carried out with some parameters, such as the parameters established parameters, salinity, ocean surface temperature, wind speed, and atmospheric pressure. Story area. The story area is the Drake Passage located between South America and the South continent. Data. Data collected by the Brazilian Antarctic Program, ProAntar, by the Antarctic Observation and Modeling System, ATMOS project, during the voyage of the polar ship Almirante Maximiano, age 41, to the southern continent were used. Satel satellite SMOS salinity and sea surface temperature data were also used. Two types of gas analysis sensor can be used. The open path in which the optical cells are exposed to the environmental and the closed path where the gas enters through tubes until it reaches the optical cell. In which the type that was used for this story was the open path sensor. A 90 meter high metal Micro meteorological tower was installed at the bow of the ship, 18.75 meters above sea level. The Campbell Scientific Irrigation Sensor was installed in this tower, configured to perform measurements at 20 heads. Irrigation has an open path infrared gas analyzer, which measures CO2 and water vapor concentration. A three-dimensional sonic anemometer, which measures the three vector components of the wind, and a thermohygrometer to measure tempera temperature and the humidity of the air, atmospheric pressure data was also collected by the tower, where we, we can see the sensor that was used to measure this data. Data correction. The correction was based on the work by Miley, based on the equation by Fujitani. Where the wind speed correction in the three components was made from accelerometer data, ship speed, and spectral filters. Where we can visualize the comparison between the corrected data, colored red, with the uncorrected data, colored blue. Results. 
a regional scale, the CO2 flux had a positive relationship with variation in atmospheric pressure at sea level, as we can see in the graph. In addition, this region presented were uh, with low salinity and low temperatures as expected because it is a region of high latitude in which there is a graph greatest solubility of CO2. However, in some specific place, it was related to the wind intensity where we can observe that in regions where the wind speed was high, it was where there was a low absor absorption of CO2 by the ocean. As we can see in the graph, when the wind speed increased, there was a reduction in the absorption of CO2 by the ocean. The stability parameter, which is given by the difference between the ocean surface temperature and the air temperature, showed that the mar marine atmospheric boundary layer was stable in most of the story region and unstable only when close to the Antarctic continent, where there was an um, increase in the flow to the atmosphere. Conclusion It is concluded that the Drake Passage had a CO2 absorber biario. According to the average CO2 flow, which was negative 1.7 micromole m squared s for the study period. And, and I leave where my email to contact. I would like to thank everyone for their attention. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, we are left with uh, four minutes now. So uh, a quick uh, question and answer session, uh, Anu. Yeah, I think Svenja will be handling this. So Svenja, oh, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah we don't please. have heaps of time, unfortunately, but uh, I mean, still we can try. Yeah. I definitely learned a lot today. It was pretty cool. Um, there's a question, I think, for Emma in the chat, uh, in the Q&A. Um, what is the depth of the sample points of sediment and seawater? Are you also looking at benthic community that is affected by the amount of biomarkers? Very interesting research. <laughs> Uh, thank you for the question. Um, the seawater is sampled from 20 meters deep. Um, and then the sediment um, samples are, are obviously sampled on the, the ocean floor. Um, but I have samples from, uh, I've got three samples that are just the first centimeter. And then I've got three um, more that are one centimeter to about 50 centimeters in one centimeter intervals. Um, so yeah, pretty short samples, but yeah, hopefully representing the present day. And, yeah. oh, sorry, just to address the third point. Oh, sorry. Uh, just to address the third point. Some issues um, are here, so you can't hear me properly. Okay, go ahead. Sorry, just to address that third point, um, I wasn't, it's not in the scope of my research, I don't think, to look at um, benthic communities and how biomarkers affect them, but it's definitely an interesting um, concept. So thank you. Awesome. Um, and can you maybe explain um, why we have different phytoplankton species in the Ross Sea? Because you said, are oh, their diatoms a bit closer to the um, coast at um, um, what's it called? Terra Nova Bay and uh, a bit more further central, we have the Phaeocystis bloom. Why is that? Um, 
that's Maybe a really good question general I'm actually, <laughs> I'm actually not entirely sure that's something I will need to look into um I'm really sorry that I can't answer that it's all right it's um, all right Mary I, yeah Maybe. I hadn't thought about that specifically it's um, all right now we have one minute <laughs> okay. the so yeah i just encourage everybody i guess um to reach out if you have any more questions um to the speakers they're also in the program so yeah feel free to reach out and i think i hand it back to dr daniel kumar for some closing remarks okay so shall we conclude yeah okay uh we are very much uh, thankful to all the speakers and the keynote speaker and all conveners for conducting this session successfully. And uh, the keynote speaker has given us an excellent talk about the atmospheric nitrate sources, how it varies from the low, high, and uh, low to high latitudes, and how it is varying in the Atlantic mid latitude, how the concentration varies from land Atlantic to Pacific, and all. An excellent talk. It's a very informative. And when we come to the uh, speakers, uh, there are uh, uh, six talks were there. And uh, one was the recorded talk, and the other five were live talk. And the first one was the Eno influence in the summer monsoon and how the tropical Pacific dipole and the South Atlantic dipole the correlation with the Indian summer monsoon, as well as how it is related with the SST. These are all discussed in the first uh, talk. And second, we talk about the DMS and the fact, factors, what are the factors affecting it, and how it is varying with uh, you know, southern latitudes and south of 30 degrees south is found to be the uh, so, uh, more concentrated area like that or not. And uh, how it is affecting the sea ice that is also been discussed in this uh, talk. And uh, then the iodine chemistry, then how, how the iodine is getting emitted in this uh, southern ocean areas and all. And of course, that uh, the speaker has told that. Uh, the Southern Ocean sector, Indian sector of Southern Ocean is a sparse area for this data. It has to be collected in a detailed way. And uh, its correlation with the uh, SST and all has been discussed. And it is a very good uh, information and it has to be studied in detail since it is affecting with the ozone layer and all. And uh, I suggest in Mooring also, we are planning in the future, it, it can be done there. If you can plan for that. And uh, the next one is the um, about the lipid biomarkers. And uh, they have uh, uh, given a detailed study about the lipid biomarkers, about the productivity, how it is, how it can be used to study about the primary productivity in this, uh, uh, especially in the Rossi regions. And then the fifth talk was about the chlorophyll and uh, how it varies with the different friends, especially the polar friend regions, how the biogeochemistry as well as the uh, physical forces as affecting the uh, chlorophyll variability. And uh, what are the uh, probable reasons for varying this pro productivity, I mean, especially chlorophyll in the southern ocean region. And the final talk was about the, the quantifying the CO2 fluxes in the dry passage region. And uh, she, uh, they have used about the eddy covariance method to compute the flux of the CO2. And they found that uh, the dry passage was especially pertaining uh, 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 to CO2, it is found to be seen. These are all the talks about the, the CO, uh, these uh, you know, the abstracts given for this session. And uh, I congratulate this all speakers and uh, the keynote speaker for giving us very good information about these studies. And the future perspective is what we are looking for is that, especially with the Indian sector of Southern Ocean, we have studied, uh, conducted 11 expeditions. And uh, in the future perspectives, uh, we are planning to study about how the Southern Ocean air and ocean dynamics is affecting the tropical uh, Indian Ocean as well as the climate. And how the air and ocean dynamics affect the biogeochemistry as well as the aerosol distributions and the air interactions. And how the global warming affect the melting in the uh, Antarctic sea area and how it is contributing to the formation of uh, uh, bottom water, water masses, how, how it is getting distributed and how it is affecting the bio, uh, carbon dynamics in the Southern Ocean ecosystem. These are all we are concentrating in future studies. And especially we are, uh, the present expedition, we are mainly concentrating on the ocean acidification as well as to uh, study Southern Ocean as a sink and a source of CO2. These are all the things what we are planning, future studies.
Thank you so much. So may I request uh, Dr. Anu to uh, give a word of thanks? Yeah, no, thank you everyone for, uh, first of all, the speakers for giving such lovely talks. Uh, they were very informative and very diverse, which is encouraging to see. Uh, unfortunately, we did not have enough time for more questions, but uh, yeah, everyone's contact details are available. So please get in touch with the speakers if uh, there's a query that you want answered. And with that, uh, thank you all, including all the co-conveners uh, who helped coordinate this entire session and the attendees for, you know, for coming for this session. With that, uh, I guess we'll have to uh, close the session and move on to the next uh, few sessions, which are going to keep going on for the next week uh, week or so. There are some really exciting sessions. So please uh, go on to the website and attend as many as possible. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs> uh, SCAR team, can we please uh, end the session?